Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in our uh, weekly uh, Department of Financial Sciences seminar um, series. Uh, today we are hosting uh, Dr. Dan Asael from Yale, but before I present him, um, Dr. Beverly Goodman, the head of the department, wants to say some words to you students, and then I will present Dan accordingly. Okay, well, first, of course, thank you, uh, Dan, for coming, especially this early hour. We appreciate it. Um, and I just wanted to let the students know, you should have seen a couple of emails that you should pay attention to. One, tomorrow we're going to have a meeting at 1030 at the university for anyone who is interested or curious or wants to get more information about the ninth annual Haifa conference, which will be in June. Um, I highly recommend that you come. Um, this will be a chance to kind of see what we're planning and to get part of the planning. The purpose of the meeting will be to uh, brainstorm, to come up with ideas, to think about the direction, and also those of you who are interested in taking, taking a more active part or being part of the committee. Um, this is also when we'll start, uh, uh, well, you'll be choosing and, and assigning um, uh, roles to people. And the second thing is there should be an email that came from Roe Diamant, which is a survey regarding being a student in the program. So um, he hasn't gotten many responses from students in the school. We, 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 I think we number something even close to 200 from all the departments, um, maybe 100. 30 now after uh, with the three departments. Um, if you could please uh, respond to that, give your feedback. It's anonymous and it's uh, to assist us going forward as we're developing the school and the department. And that's all. I hope everyone's well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, so as I say, uh, today we're hosting Dr. Dan Sell from Yale. Um, Dan did his um, uh, bachelor, master, and PhD um, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, the PhD uh, entitled Copper Stable Isotope Fractionation in Low Temperature Geological System was supervised by Professor Al Matthews and Dr. Miriam Barmatis. Then, after um, the, that study, he continued into a postdoc in. Um, Institut Universitaire Européen de la Mer, which is in uh, Brest in France uh, for a couple of years, in which he continued to work on um, iron and molybdenum isotopes and major trace elements and key geological units in black shells. Um, then he continued he continue as a must um, MC ICP MS lab manager at the Laboratoire Geochimie and Metallurgy um, at the French Research Institute for Exploration of the Sea, which is Inframel in Brest in France, for another year. Um, prior to continuing at the University of Liège in Belgium for another postdoc. And then since then, and since uh, 2014, 15, he is in uh, Yale in the United States. So um, today is um, is uh, join us on uh, on the weekly seminar and please Dan the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, good morning to me and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I will get just right to it. I'll share a screen and let's start. So uh, I've been, uh, you know, working on this talk, and the title I gave was uh, "What You All Got." It's uh, what can we learn about the Earth's redox history um, from the Jirina Formation, which is 2.63 uh, giga ago. And while I was working on it, I thought maybe I'll add a little more. And um, where is it? So another title could be molybdenum isotopes is a key for better understanding the redox evolution of the Archean Proterozoic Ocean. So um, I'm going to start with the Jirina formation as promised. I'm going to talk mostly about molybdenum isotopes and iron isotopes and a few things that we can learn about these and, um, and, and about the ocean at the time. And then I'll move a little forward on time. Hopefully there's also time for the talk, but we'll see. So let's start with uh, some introduction. So molybdenum is a transition metal. It has uh, seven stable isotopes. And you can see here, um, 
they are actually distributed quite nicely between nine to 20 something percent. The only reason I'm saying it because it makes it um, easier and more convenient to measure. Uh, so from an analytical point of view, it's a, good, it's a very good element. The delta values that I'm gonna show calculated just like any other delta values that you see in uh, geochemistry, um, calculated relative to a standard. The main standard is, that is reported uh, these days is the NIST SRM 3134 uh, plus 0.25 per mil. Uh, the reason for this plus is some historical reasons because the first standard came from the real Anbra lab and it was a little different and people kind of got used to this value. Uh, but that uh, for you is just uh, uh, one uniform standard, all the values that are going to be shown in this talk. Uh, isotopic fractionation factors are shown as capital delta. There are some uh, facts here about uh, the molybdenum concentration in modern uh, oceans and rivers and residence times, which is uh, um, almost uh, a million years. And just one little uh, uh, fact about uh, molybdenum, the atomic number is 42, which we should all know it's the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything, at least according to Douglas Adams. Um, okay, so this is what the modern molybdenum uh, uh, cycle look like at, in the oceans. So we have the global seawater with a delta value of uh, about 2.3 per mil. And this, as I'm gonna show also later, and this is very critical, um, this value, this isotopic composition is a function of the um, balance between the different sources and sinks, just like is any other uh, system. And the main input of molybdenum into the ocean is riverine input. Molybdenum had come as dissolved molybdenum with rivers into the oceans. It's at least 90% of the molybdenum and its uh, value is about 0.7. There's also molybdenum coming from hydrothermal fluids. The value, the isotope composition of it is a little, well, a little less well constrained. Uh, but we think it's something similar to the riverine input or probably even lower even here, even though here I put 0 0.8, 0 0.8 because it's just there was at the time there was one reliable paper that 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 gave a number, but we're thinking because it goes through uh, magmatic rocks, it probably closes to the bulk earth value on the long term, which is around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but that, that's a good number. And then we have the sinks, and the sinks are maybe uh, uh, the thing that we're going to talk a lot about in, in this talk. Uh, we have the oxic sink, which means molybdenum removed from seawater into oxic sediments. There's about three per mil fractionation, and therefore the delta value of these sediments today in the modern ocean is about 0.7 per mil. A burial rate is really very slow, especially compared to the other things. And the reason for that is that molybdenum, when it's uh, transferred into the ocean, it's transferred as the molybdation, it's MOO4. And this is a very conservative, non-reactive uh, um, molecule. Now we have anoxic and suboxic conditions. In these kind of conditions, uh, there's quite a large variety of fractionation factors happening. Uh, in average today, uh, such sediments will hold a delta uh, molybdenum value of 1 to 1.5. And as you can see also up here, uh, the uh, burial rate is much higher. And then we have the oxenic conditions. The oxenic conditions are maybe the most interesting and the thing that we are um, after. And the reason is that in oxenic conditions, and I'm going to show more about it in the next slide, is that under euxenic conditions, there's the potential for the molybdenum to be completely removed into the uh, sediment and therefore record the global seawater value. So the whole point is that, <clears throat> sorry, if we find, <clears throat> if we find an uh, uh, old uh, sediment, whatever age that we show it was euxenic, uh, precipitated under euxenic conditions, we can maybe infer what was the global uh, seawater value. And from there, maybe say something about the balance between the different um, redox conditions in the oceans and say something about the ocean. So, and, and, and also you can see that the burial rate is much higher. So let's just go dive a little bit into the euxenic conditions. 
So uh, the reaction in eucinic condition is that a molybdate, the molybdate ion, the MOO4, given there's enough H2S, the enough uh, the sulfide ion in the uh, in the seawater is completely and quite rapidly transferred into the teomolybdate, the MOS4. And this one is very active and being uh, the thing is that the equilibrium fractionation between these two species is very high. It's about 6.75 per mil. So we have to be very careful before we just take uh, some, um, let's say, black shell unit who says, oh, that's, you know, must have been euxenic. Let's see what was the seawater value. No, we have, we, we have to verify that. And, um, and the way we do it is we use iron speciation. Iron speciation is, is when we take our sample and we um, and then we can make all these ratios and calculations, which if we take the highly reactive uh, iron phases, these are all iron phases that are, as, just as it says, highly reactive to the total iron. We need this ratio to be above 0.38 and the pyrite eight. And if these conditions are met, then we know that our sample was precipitated. 8.8 was later uh, updated to 0.7. So some of the uh, figures might show 0.7. And another thing is that usually under euxenic conditions, we get low um, molybdenum over TOC, uh, the total organic carbon. And as I says, uh, and as I said, uh, burial rates are quite high. And uh, then the bottom line here is that molybdenum in black shell may directly reflect the contemporaneous ocean in terms of the uh, isotopic composition, of course. So a few more words about the uh, Iron speciation, and then again, what we do is practically we put you know those two ratios that we cut, measure and calculate on this space, and then this space can define where is euxenic zones. Samples that will fall here will be euxenic samples. Samples that fall here will be uh, ferruginous, which means which means that the main ion in in the water in the solution is iron, and then here is the oxic zone. Um, let's see if I missed anything here. Yeah, all right. So, and a few more words now about the molybdenum uh, TOC. So when we look at modern and ancient sections of black shale, we see that there is a quite nice linear correlation between molybdenum concentration and the total organic carbon. And each basin, given it shows it's, it's a steady state and equilibrium basin show relatively uh, a constant molybdenum concentration in the ocean, in in the in the water, then you, we get nice you know correlations here with defined slopes that also tells us about the uh, uh, molybdenum concentration of the basin. Um, the two more sinks that uh, that we see are the suboxic and uh, the suboxic anoxic and the oxic. So the suboxic anoxic anoxic. Um, uh, down here shows there's a variety of reaction of removal of molybdenum into the sediment. In average, they give something like 1.1 per mil. There's a, uh, I don't know what the reference here, but there was a, there's supposed to be a reference here for a work of Tatiana Goldberg. Uh, she did all these experiments and came up with this number, which is pretty much in everybody agree with. And then, um, uh, so that's that's a fractionation type factor that we take into account. In oxic conditions, it's again, it's adsorption into mangan oxides mostly. Um, it's much more constrained. It's about three per mil. So I gave you all that. And now what we can do is think about the molybdenum cycle in the oceans, modern and, and ancient oceans. And we can just formulate them in this equation here where we see we have the inputs. This is the uh, rivers and, and hydrothermals. And then we have euxenic, oxic, and, and, um, and suboxic and oxic. And of course, the uh, uh, sum of the input must equal the sum of the output. 
And the idea is that if we have the delta value of the uh, euxenic component here, we can, because the difference of fractionation factors, we can infer what was uh, the delta value of the oxic and the suboxic anoxic. And then we can try to solve this equation and say something about, you know, how much of the oceans were euxenic, how much of the oceans were uh, oxic, how much were in suboxic and oxic conditions. At least that's what we want and that's what we were trying to do. So the main goal to begin with is to uh, find a nice euxenic sediment that can give us a good estimation of what was the seawater value. So a few words about uh, lab work, just uh, really briefly. So powdered samples are ashed at uh, 600 degrees for about 20, uh, 24 hours. This is in order to get the get rid of the organic matter, which later in the chemistry uh, can give you a lot of trouble. Uh, samples are digested quite uh, uh, regularly in a series of acids. We do trace and major elements me measurements in mostly ICPMS, sometimes using ICPAS. A split according to the uh, uh, molybdenum content content of each sample. We split. We take a split and we add a spike, a double spike of ninety-seven and nine and hundred molybdenum. If anyone interested, I can explain later about the double spike, but this is a whole uh, uh, long story. And then there's a two-stage two chromatographic separation work where uh, first molybdenum is separated with the, from the matrix, most of the matrix, but because especially these kind of samples have so much iron in them, the tail of the iron go in, and then we need also a second stage cation um, columns. Measurements are done on the uh, thermal Neptune MCICPMS, which is a multi collector. And the idea of the multi collector is that you collect all the masses that you're interested in at the same time, which gives you much better precision and accuracy. And of course, we measured you know, standards and geostandards and, and all that. All together, all together give us a quite good uh, reproducibility and, and accuracy and precision. As you see, about point. 0 0.04, 0 0.056 uh, per mil. So that's all for, um, for background. So let's talk about uh, the Great Oxidation event. The Great Oxidation event that happened about 2.4 billion years ago was a very critical event in Earth's history. And everything that we're going to talk about today is somehow related to it. So the Gerina is something that is, is a formation that precipitated before that. But um, as many people suggest, it kind of was a clue, was a, a precursor of, of the Great Oxidation event. There was several events just before that. So the Great Oxidation event is when oxygen to a measurable, considerable levels was introduced to the atmosphere and to the oceans for the first time in Earth's history. And uh, most, uh, I guess, the nicest, most beautiful work that shows that is the Farquhar 2007, where he measured the uh, sulfur mass independent fractionations signals. And what he showed that, as you can see here on the top uh, left, is this MIF, uh, S MIF signal was very, very well pronounced from the beginning of Earth's history, from the oldest samples that uh, they could find until 2.4, and then at 2.4, it's just flattened. It's disappeared completely. And the idea behind that was that if there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, you can have some sulfur in the atmosphere, and sulfur in the atmosphere is what creates this, uh, this signal. So that was maybe the most compelling, most you know, nicest, best uh, evidence for that. And then, you know, there were many studies come afterwards. The Scott et al. that also did something maybe a little similar, or at least in terms of the, uh, the time scale for molybdenum uh, concentrations. And then there was the paper of Planovsky et al, uh, where they practically uh, try to assess what, what was back then considered the, um, the most governing theory about the Kenfield Ocean, where the oceans were up to a little after the Great Oxidation event were mostly ferruginous. And then they were uh, redox stratified with a, a sulfide, uh, uh, um, sulfidic bottom water and oxic uh, uh, upper column. 
and then the oceans went completely oxic. The idea here is that uh, the oceans were considered, or Earth in general, considered to have gone through some kind of a two-step function, where the first step is the great oxidation event, and then the other, the second one, happened at the end of the Precambrium, where oxygen levels reach something like similar to at least uh, modern levels. There's also a nice work just published recently using, again, molybdenum concentrations and isotopes to uh, pretty much break down these first uh, two, these two billion years between four to two billion years ago and showing that maybe there's a few periods there and they were trying to calculate minimum oxygen values uh, using some uh, advanced modeling. The main thing I want you to see here is that this time at around 2.6, where you see that we already something happening in the system. There's already um, higher molybdenum concentrations and higher delta values. So something has already happened there. And that's where our Gerina formation sits. And again, in another compilation here shows exactly the same thing that all this period between 3.3 giga and 2.5, again, there's all these little arrows suggesting what some people are defined as or uh, called um, whiffs of oxygen. So there was a little bit of a pr production of oxygen. We see some traces of that, but it was not enough to completely oxidize the atmosphere, definitely not the oceans. So all that we can ask, uh, did the molybdenum isotopic system, system have recorded Archean oxygenation at 2.63? So the Gerina formation uh, from, the, from Western Australia, and it sits, if we go back to the same uh, figure here, it sits right here, which means it was supposed to be, according to the um, uh, Kenfield Ocean, a still very uh, ferruginous ocean. And, um, and, and, and it's a black shale, so it, that's what makes it interesting and unique. Uh, why it's unique? Because black shale, when, it's a bit of a spoiler what I'm giving now, but it's a, it, we do see euxenic conditions, and we're not supposed to have euxenic uh, conditions at this time. So it's like we take a, 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 some, um, a section that show uh, compelling euxenia that usually is typical to the uh, post GOE, but it's it happens before, and we still want to see okay what can we learn of it. It's it's like a little uh, lab that happened back then. So now briefly, I just want to show. Uh, so th this is first of all, this is the the data. In the middle here, we see the uh, um, iron speciation, and we see that this uh, uh, grayed part here is our euxenic interval. We see a higher TOC, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, um, molybdenum over TOC is lower, which also makes sense, especially considering that the total organic carbon is higher. And, um, and you know, we have a quite reasonable uh, range of values here of molybdenum isotope composition. And, and again, if we uh, plot this, uh, this data on the space of the iron speciation, yeah, we have at least some samples that fall within the oxenic zone. So let take, let's take these samples and see what we can do with them. So first of all, we need to verify that what we see is an autogenic um, signal. So for that, we can plot the delta molybdenum uh, versus aluminum molybdenum ratios. And then the little star here, this is what the continental crust, the average continental crust would be in terms of aluminum and, and delta. So we see that all of the samples have more molybdenum relative to aluminum compared to the continental crust. And also in terms of isotopic composition, most of them are higher. And the other thing that is as um, uh, reassuring for us is that when we look at the molybdenum uh, versus total organic carbon, we do see some correlation. It's not the greatest correlation, I'll take that, but it's something, again, suggests that the molybdenum came from the solution from seawater and not just the trial particles that, that were you know, transferred into the, the basin. So the question here is, did the molybdenum isotopic system have recorded Archean oxygenation at 2.63? And in order to even try to um, answer this question, the first thing we need to get is an 
assessment of what was the uh, uh, isotope composition of molybdenum at the time. Now, this is a little tricky because um, at the time, and that's something we know, Archean oceans were very low in molybdenum, even though it seems like there was some. Sorry. So the assumption is here, and, and I'll, I'll explain now why I think it's a good assumption, is that we do see some kind of a mixing line here. And as you saw before, molybdenum, when it's removed from the seawater into the sediment, it could either have no fractionation if conditions were euxenic enough, there was enough H2S available, and we had a complete removal. But if it, that wasn't the case, then fractionations are always negative. So we can predict that in case of where um, uh, the trital contribution was somewhat significant, we'll get a mixing line with some samples falling below this mixing line. They can only fall below the mixing line, again, because fractionations can be only negative. So I think this is exactly what we see here. This is our mixing line, which uh, capture most of the euxenic samples. And there's all these samples below the mixing line because, well, they, were, they didn't experience a complete removal. And therefore, some fractionations were uh, pronounced in, this, in, this, in these samples. So if we take that, we get an estimation of uh, 1.1 per mil for the contemporary seawater. And uh, then we say, okay, let's take this number and see what we can say using this number about the 2.63 giga um, ocean. So um, what we what we want to do first is to ask the question if the oceans, if there's any chance at all that the oceans at the time were uh, homogeneous with respect to molybdenum. So we take uh, just a simple calculation. We take the ocean mixing time, the ocean volume, and then the molybdenum input in modern oceans. Uh, we that's something we know. And then the question was, okay, so what was the molybdenum input back then? That's a big question. And the way I thought of answering this question, excuse me, <clears throat> is to uh, go to uh, Eva Stoiken uh, paper, where what she did is she made uh, pretty much the same thing, but for sulfur. And because most of the molybdenum on the continents comes from uh, sulfides and then weathering of sulfides, um, one can say, okay, let's just assume it's, it's um, um, reasonable assumption to assume that they are linearly correlating. So I just went to her, uh, this period of time between 2.5 to 2.8 and sulfur uh, um, um, input into the oceans was about three times, 3.6 times slower than modern, modern. So I just did the same for molybdenum. Then for uh, concentration, this is a, a concentration in modern oceans. In the Archean, according to Scott et al., there were less than five nanomolar. I took two numbers just for the exercise 0.5 and, and four nanomolar. And then the residence time of the Archean oceans that we get is something about between 12 and 100,000 years, which is considerably higher than the ocean mixing time which suggests that there's a good chance that uh, the oceans were indeed homogeneous with respect to molybdenum at the time. So I said, okay, so let's assume that this value that we got, 1.1, is indeed uh, a representative of the global ocean. Let's see what it says about the global ocean if, if it makes any sense to us. So we go back to the mass balance equation. We can, in this time, we can completely um, ignore or just remove the oxic term because even if there was a tiny, tiny bit of oxic uh, conditions at the time of the oceans, they were definitely negligible. We're talking about the Archean. Um, so we can just remove that. It makes our um, calculation much simpler. And then we make all these assumptions for the delta values of the different sinks which are all calculated relative to the 1.1 value that we got. And we get that 40% of the molybdenum at the time was removed from seawater into euxenic conditions and 60% into anoxic suboxic conditions. Now, this is, these are fluxes 
And the idea was, okay, so we have the fluxes. Fluxes are not telling us that much. Let's try to see if we can convert the fluxes into relative seafloor area. And we can do that using the burial rates uh, given by Scott et al. And then we get that 12% of the seafloor and uh, was euxinic and 88% of the seafloor was anoxic. Of course, there's some error on this number, but that can give us a clue of what happened in the oceans back at 2.63 giga. So um, let's just kind of summarize a little bit what we've seen so far. So the 2.63 giga black shale of the Gerina formation show clear uh, autogenic enrichments of molybdenum. That's just on itself is, is quite reassuring because um, when we look at formations and samples older than three giga, definitely they show just the tridal signatures. There's no, no evidence whatsoever for dissolved molybdenum in the system. Uh, we suggest that sulfur oxidative weathering under anoxic atmosphere del delivered dissolved molybdenum and sulfur into the ocean. And that these two things, again, they probably came together. There was some oxygen availability at the time, and this oxygen was very rapidly consumed uh, for weathering, and this weathering supplied the dissolved molybdenum that we see, but possibly also the dissolved sulfur, sulfur that we see that enhanced the uh, uh, euxinic uh, condition. A first order uh, calculation shows that the ocean may have been homogeneous with respect to molybdenum. And then this number that we got, 1.1 per mil, suggests that it's possible that about 10% of the seafloor at the time was covered with uh, euxinic conditions. So now let's talk a little bit about iron isotopes. So iron have four stable isotopes. Um, and unlike molybdenum, they are very uh, miserably distributed, which makes life a little harder for uh, the measurement. Uh, the delta value, again, is calculated just, just like any other delta and, and isotope fractionation factor are, are you know, uh, formulated, again, the same way. And here there's, a, 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 again, a representation of the modern uh, oceanic iron cycle. Uh, there's many different, un unlike molybdenum, there's several different uh, significant sources of uh, iron into the ocean. But the nice thing is, as you can see, most of them are around zero per mil uh, because iron doesn't fractionate that easily in in the set in in any system practically and uh let's just move on all right so the whole um, um the whole debate or much of the debate of the uh, um iron isotope started in a paper that was published by ruxel at 2005 is this one ruxel 2005 i took this the, this diagram from amber ruxel just because it's a little nicer but essentially the same thing and what he did he uh, measured um the iron isotope compositions of pyrite through um Hearst history and he came up with this nice plot and then the question that, that is, was asked is what processes control iron as a top of fractionation in the ocean through her history? And you can see that they, they split it to three stages. The first stage, which is up until pretty much the great oxidation event, uh, pyrites were mostly negative. Then they went to around zero, maybe slightly positive. And then in stage two and then st stage three, they all go uh, around zero, maybe slightly negative um, uh, values. And there's clear change here. And the question is what happened? So uh, <coughs> uh, Ruxel et al. and later with the publication also with Planowski, they suggested uh, the three stages to look like that when before the great oxidation event, uh, where oceans were ferruginous, there was a slow oxidation, oh, flow process of iron oxide precipitation, which um, uh, fractionates and leaves the seawater um, um, negative at, at the lower, at, yeah, at delta values that are negative, 
later these delta negative delta values meet um, um, conditions where pyrates could precipitate means uh, and there's enough sulfur and then they practically pronounce they practically are evidence of the fractionation and the Rayleigh fractionate that happened in the open sea before that later on there was uh, uh, oceans become um, redox stratified they're no longer uh, ferruginous and for that reason this process is pretty much muted and the precipitation of pyrites is mostly a function of what's going on with sulfide availability there, and then we get the zero or slightly positive uh, values. And then in the moderns or modern-like oceans, where oceans are completely oxic, uh, co completely oxygenated, then iron is just removed right away because it's very reactive under oxic conditions, and there's practically no uh, net fractionations. So that's how they explain that. Um, and then came uh, Johnson et al. when they argued that they said no, the main the main fractionating process of iron that that you know responsible for the pattern that you see is practically a dissimilatory iron reduction. And the reason that we see differences between the time periods is again is about all about sulfate availability. Uh, and then Gilbo came and he said, well, uh, no. And he uh, performed a series of uh, uh, experiments of pyrite precipitation. And he came up with a range of, of fractionation factors. And he says, you see, we can explain all of that just with mass balance considerations during pyrite precipitation and again, you know, we know the Archaeans were, were poor in sulfate, the uh, uh, Proterozoic was rich in sulfate, and that's why, why we see this pattern. And I'm, I'm, I was thinking, okay, so let's go for the Geraino formation. Geraino formation could be actually useful here because, as I said before, it's a euxenic, that there's a euxenic uh, interval there in oceans that were supposed to be <laughs> Um, all um, ferruginous. Excuse me a second. So, um, so that's that's really the the unique thing about the Gerina formation. So again, as we you saw before, we have this euxenic zones. Um, this is here, and this is the uh, delta iron values, and we see the shift from non euxenic to euxenic samples. We know that <clears throat> post GOE sections, which are commonly euxenic, show distinctly a different pattern of Fe isotope composition. <clears throat> so the isotope composition that we see here is actually more typical to what we see after the GOE. And then the question is the precipitation of the iron oxides versus uh, sulfate availability and the simulatory iron ratio. Which of these processes? Which, which are those suggested models is really responsible for what we see in the Gerino formation. And maybe we can also say something of which one of these guys uh, of these, sorry, of these uh, studies actually uh, uh, is closer to what really happened. So we, there's a few things that we need to look at. First of all, we have here, you see this is iron versus aluminum iron. And this is here the continental crust. So unfortunately, it's much messier than with the molybdenum. But one thing to consider, if this is the continental crust here, and those diamonds here are the pure pyrites. So I have some measurements here that are pure pyrite separates, and all the rest, those circles are just bulk rock. So if this was, if this was all at the trital signal, we would expect to see the samples falling within this triangle that defined by the range of the pyrites and the uh, continental crust, but that's not the case. So we can be pretty sure that most of the molybdenum, that, not molybdenum, sorry, iron that we see is autogenic iron. The other thing is that we want to see is that, okay, both of the, uh, this dear um, uh, hypothesis and also the one for Gilbo, but just all 
that suggest that everything that we see is a, it's about a mass balance between iron and sulfur during a pirate a precipitation, both of them should say, okay, so this is, um, this is, uh, um, how to say, I lost my thoughts for a second. So we have the delta here. Yeah, okay. So the sulfur, if, if there's more sulfur, what, what we should consider, if there's more sulfur, more of the iron will be converted into, dissolved iron will be converted into uh, pyrite, and therefore values should be higher when we have euxenic samples. So these are the euxenic samples that show, uh, um, 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 you know, the, the iron speciation to be euxenic. And what we see is actually the opposite. So it's unlikely that um, it is the mass balance between sulfur and iron at the site of precipitation that dictates these delta values. So, and, and again, it's, it's even if we just look at the pyrite separate that give us negative uh, values, um, they give us the negative values just like any other uh, Archean pyrites. So altogether, I think this, uh, this data is suggest that it was um, um, Ruxer et al from 2005 and then later with Planovsky and Anbar that were practically have the, the better idea of what was governing the isotope fractionation processes in the oceans at the time. All right, so um, this is it for the Gerina. Do we have enough time? Nicholas? Anyone here? We All have right. X five minutes. Five yes. minutes. We, are here. we have time, yeah. It's okay. My microphone, yeah, we do. Okay. So okay, I'll go briefly. So um so I, I wanted to go a little fo forward in time. And then we stop just right after the GOE, and there's this this three formations: the uh, Timebolt Hill formation at 2.32, which is just right at the end of the GOE, and then the Syngoma and the Zaonega formations. And this is a very interesting period of time because it's just right after the Great Oxidation Event, and we know that there are a lot of things that happened during this time. So let me just jump into it. Uh, we plot it on the iron speciation diagram. We get euxenic intervals in all of these. And here, uh, when we plot the DOP versus uh, pyrite iron over highly reactive iron, we get quite nice linear correlation, which again is just a way to uh, uh, suggest that um, our signal is autogenic and there were no much um, um, uh, alteration processes. Um, this is pretty much the same thing, uh, delta molybdenum versus molybdenum concentrations or one over molybdenum or molybdenum aluminum, all showing that we're getting um, an autogenic signal. I'll just jump in right, right into the data because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so if we put them as a, as a time series, so these are the three uh, uh, that data points that we have, we see that um, uh, the molybdenum isotope composition across this time goes from 0.32 to 1.2 and back down. Again, this, this 0.32 is, is almost a detrital signal. This is definitely enriched. This is definitely a value that suggests a considerable amount of dissolved molybdenum in the oceans. And then we're going back down. Um, 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 molybdenum concentrations also show, show a mirror picture of that, and also the molybdenum over the total organic carbon. So we can take these values, uh, put them again in the same equation, and, uh, and considering the same mass balance that I showed earlier, and this time we have, um, we have three components. It's, it's, we cannot neglect the oxic component again, and so the way I was thinking of, which would be nice to present it, is to actually put that on uh, triangle diagrams because we're geologists and we love triangle diagrams, so why not? 
So what we see here is fluxes, you know, the oxic flux, the um, uh, suboxic and oxic and euxinic flux. And using this diagram, we can plot these triangles and put the contours of the delta of the seawater for each formation. For instance, if we take the one, um, where was it? Uh, the value, let, let's try this one with 1.2 per mil, right? So um, the, the one round one, two per mil will sit, will, will uh, cover this gray area. The two lower ones will cover this point, which means that again, something like more than 60% of the molybdenum at the time will be removed into euxenic conditions and maybe something like 40 to suboxic and oxic and so on. But again, these are fluxes and fluxes are maybe a little less interesting. So we can take this diagram and once again, change it to a relative seafloor area. And we're looking at that seafloor area. I must say the beginning, that was a little uh, confusing because what we see here, you see the way this um, grade area shaped is that um, we get the balance between suboxic and, and euxenic settings, but we can go all the way up there. The ratio between these two things will remain pretty much the same, but we can have either uh, uh, zero oxic conditions or you know 40 percent 60 percent 80 percent almost up to 100 percent and and maybe one general conclusion that is very interesting from that is that for most of the earth's history which means throughout the archean and the proterozoic it's the balance between the euxenic settings and the suboxic and oxic settings that actually determines the uh, delta 98 molybdenum of seawater. And in order to get values that are similar to the modern values, um, like 2.3, we really need to have the ocean almost completely oxygenated, more than 99, 99%. You see only up here, we get values that are similar to the modern ocean. And we can also plot contours of burial rate just to see how the efficiency of molybdenum uh, removal from seawater to the sediment may change and still get the same, uh, the same picture. Um, to continue this exercise, what I did is that I changed a little bit. So over, over time, after you know, people start measuring molybdenum, over time people say, well, you know, it may be wise to consider some fractionation happen in a euxenic setting and maybe a little higher fractionation uh, taking place under a suboxic and oxic condition. So I just adjusted that to see it's something like sensitivity test uh, to the system. And the, the, main, the main result of it is again, that it's still what we get is that the oceans throughout most of its history are mostly sensitive to the balance between the uh, suboxic and oxic settings and euxenic settings. It would be a little, if we consider that it will be a little easier or we get modern ocean values a little faster or in little less oxygenated oceans, but the picture pretty much remains the same. Um, so I'll just summarize it quickly and then we can have some time for questions. So what we see is that uh, during the Timebull Hill formation, we get a very low delta values. Uh, um, we have evidence for non-steady state molybdenum cycle because, well, we jumped through it, but the uh, molybdenum versus DOC suggests that. We have unstable atmospheric ocean oxygen levels. And remember, this is right after the great oxidation event and uh, oceans are still anoxic, increased euxenia. What about the euxenic sink is, as I just showed, is really hard to say. <clears throat> and then we definitely see some serious oxygenation in the Sengoma. There's also other evidence that there was an overshoot of oxygen. So oxygen really jumped really high for a short period of time and then crashed. And this is practically probably showing and, and supporting this overshoot of oxygen. 
but we see stabilization of the oceanic moly cycle and um, exhaustion of the ocean molybdenum reservoir, we see uh, uh, lower concentrations. And then again, as I said, this is the crush after at the, at the upper Zalonega formation, we see a crush of oxygen, delta values becoming lower. Again, almost just like the general, the overall input, what we think was the overall input of molybdenum into the ocean. And, uh, and oxygen level crushed to the lowest levels known after the great oxidation event. So um, I'll leave you with that general summary and maybe we'll just open up for questions before we completely out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it was really enlightening and very new to many of our students. Um, so I will, uh, I will open the podium for uh, questions from the audience. I, again, I don't see all of you guys, so please raise your hand or just uh, pop in. Um, Hi, I have a question. Please go ahead, Karen. Uh, can you elaborate more about the spike you're using? Yes, of course. Um, so the spike, wh what exactly do you want to know about the spike? <laughs> Um, more of the preparation process, because uh, we tried to do it and it was pre precipitating all the time. So I'm trying to understand there is another. Okay, so so the spike that we're using, we just bought, you know, a spikes from, I think back then it was from Oak Ridge. So you, we bought them separately, the 97 and the 100. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you get it. It was a long time solid, ago. Right? But as what? As a solid. Yeah, as a solid, as a powder of molybdenum oxide, I think it was. Um, I can look up if, if it's interested, but if you're interested, but I can look, I don't remember exactly how we did the digest, but we kept it in a quite strong acid, in All a right. you know, nice little <laughs> Teflon bottle. And then according, the, the idea is that when you spike and each, each, uh, double spike system will behave maybe a little bit differently. But for molybdenum, I found that if the amount of molybdenum coming from the spike should be the same as the amount of molybdenum coming from your sample. Okay. So you take a split. Let's say you want to run uh, at uh, a 50 ppb on your, on your mass spec. You take the amount that you need from your sample. You add the spike. You evaporate the sample completely. And then you start uh, the column procedure. All right. All right. Okay. And then the, the idea of the spike, it's to correct for any fractionation that may occur either on your columns or you know, on the machine as what, what's called an um, instrumental mass bias. OK. Um, I would say that if if your spike precipitating is just probably uh, storage in acid that it's not appropriate. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm just gonna try it again. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um. Somebody else has have another question. Okay. Um. Abdelaziz wrote a question in the chat. Um, is molybdenum concentration affected varies or affected or varies down the formation or stratigraphy across some locations? Well, okay. can, can you repeat? Is molybdenum concentration affected or vary down the formation or stratigraphy across sample locations? Maybe you should rephrase it if you don't understand. I don't. I don't quite understand what he's trying. And I. Don't, how do I? Oh, wait, just a second. I have Delizzi, some... Can you maybe ask the question verbally? My question is: uh, Is my molybdenum concentration affected down the formation? Or a, stra or a stratigraphy from all the sample locations? This is my question. If it's affected by the sample location or the yes. stratigraphy? Yes. Well, as, as you saw uh, in some of the plots that I showed here, 
Um, if you look through, th you know, through a section, yeah, the, the molybdenum is, you know, is changing, right? Um, as far as we understand today, molybdenum concentration is mostly a function. Well, first of all, you have the, you know, uh, uh, sedimentation rate. Sometimes, you know, higher sedimentation rate, lower sedimentation rate, how much the trital input you have. That's one thing. The, also, it's the redox conditions, you know, under oxy conditions, the removal rate is much lower. And it's not, you know, it's not a step function. You don't just jump right from uh, either oxic to suboxic and oxic or to uxinic. So you could be sometimes somewhere in between. So of course, um, molybdenum concentrations change and they change according to how much molybdenum is available at the time and what would be the, uh, the redox conditions. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I would have thought that during the, uh, the great oxidation event, well, let's say before the great oxidation event, um, during continental erosion, which is supplying molybdenum to the sea, it mostly, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. that not much of the molybdenum in the, in the bedrock would actually get into the ocean because uh, it's mostly in the form of sulfide. And, and the sulfide just gets buried as, as, uh, as detrital particles and doesn't get oxidized and doesn't uh, get dissolved into the ocean. So I would think that the flux of molybdenum as of input into, into the rivers and into the sea would be much lower in, the, uh, in that period. And, the, and it may actually have an ice stub effect, though I don't, I don't know what it is, but since this is all- Yeah, so I, yeah. So, yeah. so first of all, yes. The, so what we see is that all the way, let's say from the beginning, from the oldest samples that we have, all the way up to around three gig I go, molybdenum sig signal is completely detrital. There was no dissolved molybdenum in the oceans, right, essentially right, at all. Right. Okay. And then at around three, and we already, already have several evidences that starting three billion years ago, there was some photosynthesis some evidence for free oxygen and this free oxygen didn't oxidize the atmosphere and apparent and and part of it probably was right away consumed by weathering and some of it is weathering of sulfides on the continents because continents were probably paved with sulfides because sulfides were so stable that they're all the over the place right yeah so i think what we see is there's, there's a little whiff of oxygen rapidly consumed by the sulfides and then we see a flush of sulfide and maybe other metals that are associated with sulfides into the ocean okay okay and and we see and we see that in in several so there's the you know the famous whiff of oxygen that uh, was uh, um discovered by a real anbar group if you know the whiff. and the what a whiff of oxygen. Yeah, a whiff. That that's that's the, the his famous paper is called the whiff of oxygen. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Something before the I don't remember exactly the title. That's why everybody right. uses this word. But but we already know of several of them, and there's also other evidences. Even today, there's this this really great paper by the um, uh, Dan Tofik and uh, Yaguda from Weizmann Institution just last year, I think it was about how from, from genetic considerations, they did a phylogenetic work and they show that uh, a photosynthetic uh, uh, life was probably started at around three giga, three billion years yeah. ago. Okay. And right. there's also a few more papers and there's also a paper that I was part of that when we, what we did, we took molybdenum isotopes, but we showed that they correlate with mangan oxides. And in order to ox Oxidize manganese. manganese yeah, you need much. You need you need a considerable need amount oxygen, of oxygen. Right. You need some oxygen for that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So so there's more and more evidence that about this period between three giga ago to the great oxidation event, there were some kind of you know pushes of oxygen. Oxygen is probably was rapidly cons okay. uh, consumed, right. but yeah. but there's evidence for that. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's sure. good.
Somebody else has a question? Well, we are already uh, deep in time, so uh, perhaps we should uh, cut already uh, this uh, today's seminar. I would like to thank you, Dan, and again. And I wondered, wanted to know if you want to stay in touch with us for the seminars that we have. Perhaps you will find them a thing for you. If you want to wake up at seven in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. Send, you know, if you send me the list that you sent the, the one at the beginning of the semester, that would be nice, yeah, of course. And uh, in any case, if you don't want to wake up at seven in the morning, we have them recorded in our YouTube channel, so. All right, perfect. So you. you can see them eventually. Uh, and next week we are going to Germany, okay? So uh, University of Potsdam in Germany. So you will see the notification soon. Okay, everybody. All right, thank you very much. Have a good day over there. Uh, beautiful day across the pond and in here. Uh, good afternoon. And maybe All right. actually, Dan, why don't I also throw out there if you've got, uh, if you know of other yours or other good PhD students finishing up searching for a good postdoc, um, the Zipperman fellowships that you're probably familiar with are uh, deadlines are coming around in a couple months. And I know that a lot of our faculty are open to hosting uh, Zipperman postdocs. So just so you're aware. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.